The guardians of this land, the Maori, have a rich and powerful culture full of mystique and an oral history that tells of a colorful and ancient past. The official story is that New Zealand was uninhabited 800 years ago when a fleet of seven canoes arrived from the Central Pacific. But a strange thing happened when they got to New Zealand. Their culture changed significantly. They built planked houses with decorative facades, used single canoes instead of outriggers, fashioned terraced village sites with amphitheatres, and created curvilinear art designs quite different to the geometric shapes of the Central Pacific. So what made them change? Was it merely the difference in climate? Or was it that they were influenced by people who were already living here? There are legendary stories of little blonde fairy people living in hobbit-like burrows and red-haired giants thundering across the landscape. Do these have any factual basis or are they all just fairy stories? In this documentary, we're going to explore a much deeper history in New Zealand. A history that explains who these blonde and red-haired people were, where they came from and why they are rarely seen today. The answers to these questions may well surprise you. Let's start with a well-known Kiwi legend about the blonde-haired fairy people of the forest. When the Māori first arrived here, the first canoe was the Arawa canoe to land here. The captain was Tamata Kapua, who's buried here on our mountain. When they arrived here, they found a race of little people here, little fairy-like people, called the Patupairehi. Māori respected them and even treated them with a little superstition, because these were the unseen people in the forest, the people they heard laughing at night and chuckling away, the people they heard rowing their small walkers across the lake at night time. And my understanding is they were uh, light-skinned, fair-skinned, with light to reddish hair. And they lived up on the mountain, on the slopes of Mount Moiho, in the mist. And they would come down the Onohi Creek, down to the sea, and there they would fish. And they usually only came out at night or when it was very misty. It is believed that when Māori came to this land, there were certain things and skills they did not have, they didn't bring with them. These are things they learnt off the Patupaiarehi. And they were a magical people. They would bewitch people, they put a spell on them, particularly women and they would lure the woman away with this flute, flute music and they would never be seen again. Did they exist as a small race of people or were they indeed a fairy race of people? We've been told about a place where these mythical people used to live. It's on the shores of Lake Okataina and it's called Tokotu Pa. I'll try and get out of here without doing old people noises. <laughs> I could have easily slept in there. And it's actually an adjoiner, so maybe it was a double, a double home for the pre Te Arawa people who would have hidden from their enemies. Archaeologists say that there are storage sheds, but my feeling is this was a village site. There are hundreds along here. There are those that are much larger, probably family size, but 
not for tall people. As well as the Patuparayahe, there's another group of fair-skinned people known as the Turahu. What do we know about them? In areas like uh, Te Papakanga Park, out towards Thames, there's a Turihu village. And on the sign out there, uh, describing Maori oral traditions of the area, they uh, speak of very small people with golden hair. They had a beautiful freshwater stream that ran through the village. They uh, cut a trench uh, from a higher point of the stream right across their arable land to provide water for their agriculture. In the valley, they've got two very nice amphitheaters that they've uh, carved out of the hill where the acoustics were wonderful. These simple kinds of amphitheaters are found all over New Zealand. And uh, based on Maori oral traditions, the people used to go to these places like the amphitheaters and speak and sing very loudly. After visiting two archaeological sites associated with the fairy people, to Papakanga Park and to Kotu Pa, we now wonder if there are any historical records about them. There's a guy in our history, uh, his name was Gilbert Meir. He was well respected amongst the Māori people. And it's like this guy jumps out with his weapon in front of the whole of this platoon, which they used to call the Te Arua Flying Column and starts jumping around and displaying his weapon and, and doing his dance. One of the guys starts loading up his musket and points at him and old Gilbert Mayer says, you know, give the man a bit of credit, you know, look what he's doing. And then as suddenly as he appeared, he disappears. He just a couple of skips into the bush and he's gone. What is sort of interesting is that this guy was fair as white, white. But the other thing was, Fully facial tattoo, Māori tattoo. Also, the legs, everything, you know. So the interesting thing is, there's a very, very tall, white person brandishing a Māori taiaha with a fully facial tattoo, which was only for the ones of high rank. We've got uh, people in New Zealand who uh, were once described as the Waka Blondes. And these are people who have a different lineage than the Polynesian people. And I grew up with many of them. I knew many of them in my uh, formative years. Worked with them on work gangs. They were the people with uh, red hair, freckled faces. They were distributed throughout New Zealand. And uh, they were Maori, but they had come through a completely different lineage. And a lot of them actually have very traceable whakapapa. That's much, much older than any of the uh, Polynesian Maori whakapapa. And they know where they came from. Uh, I know one uh, individual, uh, an old kuia, a very dignified lady, who uh, claims to come out of Persia. And the area that she's talking about, very close to India. And um, when we did DNA analysis on this lady, uh, it shows a high incidence of her blood group or her DNA in the Persian area. So she's quite correct. But then the second big, uh, block, if you like, of people that share her DNA are found in Peru. This is very interesting as it concurs almost exactly with a Maori legend recorded over a hundred years ago by ethnologist Elsden Best when he was living amongst the Tuhoi people. The legend tells us that their ancestors in times long passed away, 165 generations or around three and a half thousand years ago, migrated from a hot country named India. The cause of this exodus was a disastrous war with the dark-skinned folk in which great numbers were slain. This war was recorded in the Indian epic known as the Mahabharat. The legend continues on to describe their voyages which eventually took them into Polynesia. They crossed the oceans to Tafiti Roa, 
a long skinny land believed to be Central America, and then on to Tafiti Nui, a very large land, South America. And from there, they ventured into the scattered isles of the Pacific. This two-hoy story describes a very different history to the one that asserts that the Polynesians came from Taiwan, and it could even turn Pacific prehistory on its head. We've always believed from the history that was handed down by Piki Te Piki Kotuku, our great-great-grandfather, that we came from the, this ancient place outside of Egypt, named ancient Persia. Today it is named Iran or Iran, whichever way you want to say it. Well, when I told my family, oh, they were proud when I told them that they came from ancient Persia. Oh, gosh, why oh we really you? are. This is my mum. Her name was Tangi Maria Tiararo Karauti. My mother was the one that gave me the history and she wanted us to know just who we were and who we are. This is my dad, Hawani James Ham. His mother was a Waratini, and the Waratini are the blue-eyed Ngati Hotu of Whakatane. I have here a photograph of my grandmother and my grandfather, Te Araroa Karauti. And my grandmother was red-headed and she had the green eyes. And she was a very, very fair lady. This photograph is of Janet. Of my ten children, she was the only one that really resembled me. And she is the only one of my ten children that had the green eyes. We wonder what motivated Monica to publish her story. Well, in 2006, I was at the hearings, and this witness was saying that we were no more, that Ngati Hotu had been wiped out, eaten out. It was quite hurtful hearing this story, and I was sitting there and I thought, oh, the hell with this, I'm going to take this through the Waitangi Tribunal and prove that we still exist. And I, I gave my history, the history that was handed down from Te Piki Kotuku, and the judge at the time, which was Judge Wainwright, she put it on the internet and it went worldwide and there was a lot of, a lot of hits came back from everywhere who knew of the people of Ngāti Hotu and it was seen by uh, the e-local magazine who took up the story. And from there I did my DNA with the Geographical Society DNA Registrar. And that DNA was sent to America to be analysed and it proved that we were of Ngāti Hotu and every bit of the history I gave at the Waitangi Tribunals was correct word to word. And my DNA took me, you know, it went to Germany, into Russia, America, among the Inca people. Now, among, in Peru, there's a cave there. There's painting in the caves that depict the Ngāti Hotu people being chased out and getting into their boats. But to me, from my DNA, we came straight here after leaving Peru, after being driven out. In South America, there is plenty of evidence of native people with golden hair and green eyes. For example, the Oricano, the Paracas redheads, and the Chachapoya blonde-headed cloud people of the Andes. But another place I know they did go to, definitely, was, was Mexico. Because in Mexico they found an ancient old tiki. So the tiki is not a Māori emblem. It belonged to the Ngāti Hōtu people. And Mexico is in my DNA. Another thing they brought with them was the, uh, the thing they put up on the tepo tepo of a man doing, you know, with his tongue hanging out and stark naked, yeah. Bess, and they Bess. Could, that's right, it was Bess. named Bess. Yeah. Bit, a little bit of a joke of man. It is an Egyptian emblem. It's not Māori at all. 